um, a lot of people, a lot of people who are with us today um, um, attended the symposium were in fact familiar with the work of Kira Morata very well. So I'm actually not going to take a lot of time uh, to introduce the film director, but rather actually kind of focus on the general position of her, of her work. Um, I'm going to start with uh, perhaps a somewhat brief explanation to uh, my own position here. Um, I try to kind of visualize it using this chart over here, which consists of three parts, and each of them represents sort of the my work uh, in recent years and different sort of angles I take uh, um, when working with uh, contemporary culture. Um, Irina. Um, um, mentioned quite a lot of work I do as a um, university uh, professor, um, but as you saw from the opening slides, I'm also a researcher at Garash Museum of Contemporary Art, leading on uh, various projects, one of which is uh, the journal, the Garage Journal. Um, in addition to that, I also work um, as an independent cultural practitioner, um, organizing various events, uh, but especially committing my time and skill uh, to working with independent artists, curators, art managers, galleries, collectors, and so on. And it is this sort of three angle perspective that I sort of see as an area where my knowledge comes from and sort of where I pick on different kind of uh, relations and different ideas uh, to use in my research outputs, um, if you wish. Um, they take on different shape and form recently, um, sometimes sort of digressing from the academic canon altogether, um, but it's actually something that inspires me a lot uh, in the work that I do. Um, in that sense, um, my position is sort of dual, but not sort of uh, structured as an opposition. Uh, to me, the work of a research and the work of the curator nowadays are two emerging kind of areas of inquiry, two emerging kind of disciplines. Um, um, they use very similar approaches, they use very similar methods, uh, and generally kind of subscribe to the same system of research ethics. Where the difference occurs is in the actual presentations of the outputs, where the curator may take it into an exhibition, whereas the researcher may actually produce a publication. And so what I'm trying to do in my work is to kind of uh, cross those um, boundaries and to really think of my work as a researcher from the curatorial perspective and vice versa. And a lot of kind of thinking recently has been a, um, um, in response to questions coming from the curators in Garage and elsewhere, and generally kind of a different sense of engagement with the public that I now have, um, that I have the opportunity to work with a museum where when you speak to, you know, your, your gallery visitor, you got to get a different sense of perspective and a different sense of experience and values that uh, when you actually give a university lecture. Um, um, so I hope that this introduction will help you kind of see my work, but also um, sort of um, see the takeaways um, as a result of, of, of that sort of thinking and that positioning um, that I've done. Um, my next bit is going to be a, a very brief caveat uh, that I wanted to talk through before actually uh, getting to the kind of main part of my presentation. And that is, I'm going to refer to Kira Muratova and the field generally as uh, a Russian director and also the field of Russian studies. Um, this thinking has no colonial agenda whatsoever. Um, it rather is an attempt to uh, globalize this perspective. Uh, I'm familiar very well with the kind of a long-standing discussion of whether Kira Muratova was in fact a Ukrainian director, whether she was uh, a Soviet director and so on and so on and so on. Um, to me, what matters here is that uh, she belongs to uh, multiple cultures, to multiple kind of uh, historical periods and agendas that I wish to bring together um, 
through the notion of uh, Russia and the Russian language in the global context, right? Where it's no longer kind of centered on the Russian Federation exclusively, but is actually kind of shared experience and shared knowledge and um, shared heritage um, altogether. So I'm saying this uh, with the view that when we come to the Q&A, I want to be sure that um, you will kind of take my discussion as, as a discussion that is very open to uh, this fluid, flexible, cross-border, transdisciplinary uh, consideration, right? Um, but I feel like it's, it's very important for me to kind of highlight why we are kind of talking about um, uh, Russian culture and the field of Russian studies more generally. Um, and what it actually says in terms of kind of academic disciplining as well out there. Um, as I understand, the talk uh, is available to uh, a whole variety of uh, participants. I thought it would be a good idea to um, just uh, bring us all up to speed on the key terms that I'll be using today, and that is queer, um, and the other one that would be of relevance here is LGBT2. Uh, um, I would like to start with the latter one, if that's okay. Um, and I'm using LGBT as an acronym here, as opposed to uh, LGBTQI plus and other variants, to suggest that historically LGBT was conceived of as a political project um, aimed at the emancipation of sexual minorities in the US context. And then eventually it gained uh, uh, resonance in the UK, Germany, and other parts of the world. So to me here, LGBT refers to a specific historical political emancipatory project um, of the second part of the 20th century, which led to um, the repeal of discriminatory uh, legislation that had existed in um, the global context as a result of you know, imperial progress um, um, in the 18th and 19th century, where those uh, laws uh, banning certain sexual activities and robbing communities of visibility were introduced. Um, as you can see, the logic of the kind of LGBT thinking is that of adding new elements to the acronym, right? So it, it eventually becomes a very kind of extended um, conglomerate of um, identities. Um, just like I have this visual on the slide here, where we can also I I include uh, um, transgender people or asexual people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in other words, it's identity-based um, category uh, that we often use. Queer and queerness are somewhat different uh, because it's a term um, that in contemporary speak is used as a way to avoid the identity politics right and uh, to think of discursive positions that one can take vis-a-vis -vis, uh, dominant discourse um, just to kind of um, account for this on possibly somewhat essential level i should say that one can be categorized as a member of the LGBTQI community because that person belongs to that community. They identify with that particular community. To be queer, doesn't, one doesn't have to be a lesbian, one doesn't have to be asexual. It's rather a position of a person who deliberately attacks or challenges or queries dominant discourse about sexuality at large, right? Um, so queerness and queering are inclusive subjectivity related categories. They're not actually kind of categorized uh, through the prism of identity. And this is an important kind of difference that um, I would like to implement today in my discussion. Um, and I'm sure um, um, uh, a lot of us are familiar with the debate, but 
if you feel like you want me to kind of unpack that in q and I'll be happy to do that. Uh, but it's the it's the former category that of queerness and queering and reframing and working critically with the dominant discourse on sexuality and sexual politics. This is what kind of matters to me today. And I'm going to take on it um, sort of at three levels, and you will see that uh, in the presentation later. But uh, generally, it's it's about self-positioning. It's also a kind of a practice of reading, um, um, in this case, reading Akira Murato's films, but it's also about asking what is it that we do in our discipline, right? Uh, and, and sort of inquiring about the history of the discipline, the kind of logic of our thinking, and generally the framework of uh, knowledge. Um, as Irina mentioned, um, today's presentation is based on a big research project which I carried out in collaboration with uh, Professor Mary Engstrom of the University of Uppsala. Um, it was funded by the Swedish Research Council and ran over um, officially sort of between 2016 and 2019, but in actual terms was a bit longer because we kind of basically hit the pandemic at that time, so the research period was extended. As part of that project, Marie and I looked at a very wide range of sources and practices across um, the globe where Russian language is used. And so again, we used Russian, Russian here as a kind of very general approach to thinking about the work of various communities who share very different experiences of belonging, of migration, of practice, uh, but that we could bring together by the notion of the language use and a kind of a general reference to uh, Russian culture. Um, this project, the research phase is um, completed now, and so Marie and I separately now uh, work on writing up um, the findings and, and publishing them. So I published um, three or four pieces uh, as a result of that project, and I hope that uh, today's presentation will also lead um, to a publication in the future. After that project was finished, I started my work at Garage, uh, which, as you know, is uh, the largest center for contemporary art in the space between Berlin and Beijing, um, specializing on um, the Russian context, uh, but also the kind of transnational global context for contemporary art. An important part of these of the work of the museum is the establishment of the archive of contemporary art. Uh, it's the first uh, private foundation to systematically collect, um, organize, and display uh, archival material relating to the history of um, Russian arts and culture since the Second World War. Um, all of the archival materials are available in free access, and so this is uh, thanks to the generous support of the donors. As part of the research agenda of the museum, I lead on various projects, including those on queer heritage, uh, and I'll talk about them in a second. Um, but probably the kind of um, primary um, area of work for me is the journal that uh, Irina mentioned. We had a privilege to work with um, uh, two guest editors just recently who uh, worked on us on a special issue called In and Out of the Museum, um, The Moving Image. Um, uh, it was guest edited by Janice Von Kien, who I think I saw somewhere there in the Zoom audience. So hello, Jenny, and again, congratulations on completing this work um, that she did with um, uh, an artist and curator, Luisa Santos from Portugal. So it's again a very exciting issue um, that conceptualizes the role and position and function of the moving in image in the Museum of Contemporary Art nowadays. So again, um, this is something to support Jania and her work, but also to kind of show uh, what sort of stuff we do uh, in this project. As part of uh, the very first issue of uh, the journal, I worked with the team of 
people in the archive. You can see their names over here. They're absolutely wonderful individuals coming from very different backgrounds. I'm sure you know Alexandra Obukova, who is one of the principal uh, agents of uh, Soviet and post-Soviet um, scene, and especially in Moscow. I'm sure you know Valeria Lidinov, who's kind of written a lot on contemporary visual culture uh, in the Russian context. So we work together um, on the archival materials that are available um, in uh, the institution. And the material that we published uh, that you can um, see if you follow this link over here was an attempt to queer the collection. In other words, to speak about materials that that belong to Russian cultural heritage and queerness, right? And we understood both of those as transnational practices, again, carried out in the Russian language. Uh, we managed to kind of uh, bring together lots of materials and um, come up with a framework for, uh, for this collection. And so we published some of that uh, rationale in the form of a visual essay that you can see over here. This is um, an example of um, one of the visuals that we used. And so again, two things concern me over here. The first is how come in the cultural tradition that is so rich in queer practices that we know so little about them, right? How come uh, there's a kind of an absence in our knowledge about those practices, about that cultural heritage? This is something that interests me as an intellectual. How come we just don't get to see that stuff? Um, the other bit that I wanted to emphasize here is that the work of those artists, the collection in the archive and the material we published really approach the issue from the perspective of queerness, not that of LGBT. And this is what I wish to illustrate here with the use of this photograph, right, uh, which belongs to one of the artists from uh, the late um, socialist period and shows uh, two women walking uh, in the street, right? Um, for some, this is just an image of two people on the street. For others, this is a truly queer moment, right, uh, where the image is less about the identity of those women, but rather is more about the queer subjectivity that is revealed here through the kind of almost classical combination of queer moments, such as doubling, repetition, um, doppelganger, um, and other elements, right? So I'm using this here as an example of the method that I employ in my work when thinking about Kira Muratova cinema and in fact other filmmakers as well. So that was the introduction to the kind of work that I've been doing, uh, trying um, to explain sort of where I come from in, in, in a way. The next thing I'm going to do is to um, speak about um, a recent event um, that I had a chance to observe, uh, which was a Zoom conference organized by the curators of um, a Side by Side Film Festival in Moscow. As you know, this is one of the oldest um, film festivals um, in the Russian language that promotes um, LGBT themed films. Um, it targets really audiences in the Russian Federation, but it has this sort of, you know, quite a transnational um, uh, followership as well. So this year, the festival took place online uh, due to COVID related restrictions, but also uh, due to yet another investigation by Russian authorities on uh, the kind of workings of the film festivals in the context of Russian Section 28 legislation, which, as you know, bans promotion of LGBT-friendly materials among minors, right? The uh, investigation did not result um, in, in any kind of allegation per se, but it really disrupted the work of the film festivals. So it actually didn't take place on site, but rather online. Thank <laughs> you. 
What matters to me is that uh, it's an ongoing event that brings together uh, lots of practitioners, lots of activists, lots of members of uh, LGBT community. This year, uh, the festival featured a panel chaired by Karen Shainian, one of the promoters of uh, Russian and kind of, you know, Soviet uh, queer cultural heritage. Um, I'm sure you know of him. Uh, thanks to his YouTube series, which uh, deals with queer celebrities um, in in um, in various countries around the world, including uh, Russia. So, the promo material for this uh, uh, conference included a statement by Karen Shainian, who literally said, "How come we don't have queer cinema in Russia?" Right. How come we don't have a lot of films that touch upon the issues of queerness? Now, I understand and support Karen's kind of um, uh, sentiment over here in the sense that it would be fantastic to have more of that stuff, right? It would be fantastic to be in a situation where those films can be shown freely and enjoyed by uh, uh, all kinds of people. But there is an element where I kind of disagree with Karen, and that is his claim that there exists no queer cinema in the Russian context, right? Uh, so this is actually what I want to do. Why is it that we're in a situation when, as I mentioned before, we have uh, a rich uh, cultural heritage of queerness, and yet we are kind of not familiar with it. We haven't seen it. And so this is what I called here in the title as unseen queer cinema. Basically, what I want to do today is to see uh, the films by Kira Muratova through a queer lens only to suggest that perhaps her cinema is one of the primary sources of queer cinema uh, for uh, the Russian culture and for other cultures as well. Um, and that as soon as you kind of start seeing Muratova's films from this perspective, when you suddenly realize that perhaps all of her work uh, can be sort of uh, framed as, uh, um, as that of queer uh, work altogether. So in order to answer this question, um, I want to consider three points, and this is what is going to be uh, the rest of my presentation over here. The first is how we can approach this question from the perspective of uh, a theory of queer cinema, what we can gain from kind of the assessment of the history of Russian studies, again, is going to be my second point. And finally, I want to share with you some kind of, um, initial thinking about Muratova's work, right, and how to approach it. Um, and that's going to be uh, the concluding uh, section of my presentation today. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one, and that is the kind of um, the queer context altogether. Um, I thought long and hard about sort of how to approach this. And in the end, sort of, I decided to start with a map. It's always a good idea to have a look at the map. So as you probably know, there were multiple attempts by uh, the United Nations to pass a declaration of LGBT rights, uh, most recently in 2008 and 2011. It didn't pass because uh, there was no majority on this issue. If we are to kind of map the way the countries voted um, in this referendum, we can see that there are, strictly speaking, three kinds of uh, territories and three kinds of approaches to the concern. Blue countries are the ones that supported the declaration, uh, red ones are the ones who opposed it, and the gray ones are the ones that abstained. And if you look at the map, you will see that, you know, the Russian Federation belongs to the sort of gray area altogether. And to me, this grayness is a kind of a phenomenon or a feature of queerness as well, meaning that it's a moment of ambivalence. It's neither here or there. It's a kind of a context in which many things are possible, yet there is no guaranteed support, or in fact, to be more precise and to use kind of uh, legal jargon over here, there is no protection for individuals engaged in those activities. 
So to an extent, and if we think of it from the kind of old school perspective, uh, being queer is always about challenging existing uh, boundaries and laws and kind of transgressing the frameworks and really pushing the context, which I believe is possible everywhere, but it's in this sort of gray ambivalent zones that are particularly kind of interesting and exciting. And this is what uh, I suppose we can explore. Now, to be sure, we don't get too excited about the, the blue areas, right, over here, the countries that supported the UN declaration. Let me just remind you that countries like Brazil have the largest number of attacks on LGBT people in the world. And the country like the US, as you know very well, uh, still has very dubious legislation where there is simultaneously protection and discrimination of those communities in the workplace, for example. Um, um, so even, even that sort of a vote doesn't actually reveal um, the actual kind of everyday situation uh, and um, opportunities for, for those people. What we see in queer theory is ongoing process of de-Westernization of the canon and de-Westernization of the terminology of practices and general kind of theoretical and historical thinking. Uh, only to recognize that every region in the world has its own rich cultural heritage and queerness that in fact was kind of obfuscated by uh, Western colonial powers as, as part of its kind of quote unquote normalization of gender and sexual identities in the 19th and 20th century. And so this process of de-Westernization is about bringing those practices, bringing that cultural heritage into the visual, uh, visible rather framework of Western discourse itself. Um, if we think about it, for again, from the kind of a legal perspective, then um, a lot of these uh, developments are quite recent, right? Uh, so whether we're talking, for example, on the so-called modesty laws in the Turkish Republic, or whether we're talking about, you know, Russian Section 28, this is all very recent um, kind of turn if in, in those countries' politics. And very often uh, those practices, those turns, those new laws, they, they sort of mimic some of the all the laws that existed in other countries um, to kind of bring it closer home. As you know, Russian Section 28 is a common copy of the British law introduced by Margaret Thatcher in 1990, sorry, 1986, which also banned positive representations of LGBT among minors. Uh, mind you, it was repealed in 2003 uh, when um, the Labour government uh, introduced a uh, Gender Equality Act and further kind of legislation that enabled uh, non-discriminatory uh, politics and eventually led to the emergence of uh, equality and diversity agenda in the United Kingdom. Uh, but coming back to our context, we are in a situation where talking about queerness is legal in the Russian Federation, but yet it is subject to uh, all kinds of scrutiny, right? And this in itself sort of supports that patriarchal kind of heteronormative discourse about sexuality more generally, right? Um, in terms of queer cinema per se, as you know, there've been three ways of kind of studies uh, of, of that cultural heritage. Um, there were various books published before the 1990s, but we, it's sort of like in the 1990s that we see the emergence of the main body of literature at that time. And if we look critically at that discourse, we'll see that, that Russia, and for that matter, uh, the work of Kira Muratova is conspicuously absent uh, from any kind of consideration whatsoever. And it's only very recently, sort of in the past decade or so, with the emergence of the global framework for queer cinema, that we see a kind of a reintroduction of those discourses into a general agenda. Um, what we see more specifically with the new queer cinema in the 1990s is a perception of sexuality as a socially constructed uh, uh, category, uh, which is fluid, changeable. Um, it can also be seen as something chaotic and subversive. Uh, all of those sorts of 
uh, values and features that uh, we have come to kind of appreciate and, and celebrate as part of uh, uh, queer practice. But it is only through the global queer cinema that we depart from this, um, you know, well-tried and, and somewhat exhausted West versus the rest paradigm, and what we are seeing a kind of an emergence of a new critical mass of uh, of publications, where we see the history of queerness as a polycentric process, right? Uh, where, for example, we can tap into cultural legacies that um, predate the Western discourse about sexuality altogether. I'm talking, in, in, you know, about the Ottoman Empire in this case, or in fact about Thailand. Um, and many other kind of parts of the world, you know, we can also consider the Arctic here too. And so this is an evolving field. Um, this is where it actually is going. Um, and it would be very exciting to see what kind of contribution the field of Russian studies can make uh, to global queer cinema. What matters to me, um, again, I want to kind of say it um, in, the, in the kind of form of a, um, disclaimer is that I see the Russian context also as polycentric, right, which is informed, for example, by the Buddhist tradition uh, on sexuality in the same uh, sort of uh, manner as it is informed by the indigenous practices of people living in the Arctic uh, that have been all kind of, you know, um, uh, perhaps um, what's the word I'm looking for here, they've been kind of uh, co-opted into the Russian cultural discourse uh, uh, more generally. So there's still that big job to do of unpicking and kind of tracing and historicizing and categorizing uh, those practices and different kinds of legacies. Um, just to confirm about global queer cinema, what we're looking at is an interest in local histories and local concerns. Uh, it's all about de-westernizing the approach, is looking at different notions of sexuality and uh, coming up with a more inclusive kind of framework of sexuality. So really shifting the emphasis from identity to subjectivity, from LGBT uh, to queerness. The second part uh, of my talk is going to be a kind of a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis the field in which I work, uh, Russian studies. Um, it's been exciting to be part of it, uh, but it's also been sometimes quite challenging to uh, sort of accept um, uh, its existing practices and values. And so this, this bit of my talk is going to be an attempt to queer the field, but also kind of to decolonize it um, as much as possible. Um, as you know very well, the field has its origins in the Cold War period, and it had different sort of names, uh, Soviet, Slavic, Slavonic, etc. Um, but either way, it was a field uh, that emerged as a response to a perceived threat of Soviet invasion. And its purpose was to enrich our understanding of the USSR politics and culture in order to make the working of Western governments uh, more effective in terms of uh, preempting those threats. You know very well, and you know we always joke about it, how in some instances uh, the USSR was dissolved. Uh, we know that since the, the, the dissolution of the USSR in 1991. In some instances, the field has been completely reimagined and reframed um, as sort of free of that ideological agenda. But in some instances, this sort of notion on, uh, sorry, this focus on the Kremlin has persisted. And so this nickname of Kremlinology is still uh, with us. Taking it closer to kind of, you know, the subject matter, and that is the, the, the cinema of Kira Muratova, um, if we review existing publications, especially those coming from the 1990s and early noughties, we will see how a lot of the discussion is about the relation of the filmmaker to the authorities, right, in relation to um, the power structures, especially when we consider the Soviet period of her work. It is less so about, you know, her interest in um, sexual practices or, in fact, in queerness. And this is 
what I'm trying to argue here today is that perhaps to an extent we are blinkered this sort of Kremlinology approach and we're not seeing um, the thing, right? We're not seeing the, the actual kind of uh, stuff out there. So to answer that question that Karen Shanian asked at the symposium, one of the reasons why we don't have queer cinema in Russia is because we've never learned how to see it. We've never actually learned how to work with it because our interest has been elsewhere. Um, there is another kind of um, interesting um, and somewhat troubling um, history of the field, uh, which has to do with the so-called lavender scare. Um, you know very well that in the 20th century, there was uh, the concept of the red scare, right? The fear of communism spreading all over the world and undermining um, capitalism. Uh, what is less known is that this red scare was repackaged um, in, especially in the US uh, discourse and practice as the lavender scare. And that was the association of communism with LGBT communities to the point that there were practices uh, which meant that uh, gay men and lesbian were not allowed to work um, in public services in the US, right? Um, so they either had to leave their jobs or they had to um, they, they had to keep their identities secret uh, uh, from, from, um, uh, from the system. And so one of the reasons why we have so little written about um, queer cinema and queer culture in the Soviet and Russian context is again, to me, a legacy of the lavender scare, right? The kind of taboo on speaking about those matters uh, uh, for the fear of persecution. Um, and so now that we're in the 21st century and thank God we're kind of uh, going through the process of unpicking those uh, difficult um, uh, um, um, legacies of the past, uh, we can perhaps kind of let it go and to think of um, queer concerns as being visible rather than invisible. Okay, I'm just making progress over here. Irina said that I have a generous amount of time today. So I'm now moving on to my final part of the presentation, uh, which is going to be me talking about Muratova's work, um, especially taking her film three stories, right, as a case study over here. But just to be sure, they can be also applied to other films as well. The first thing that I want to do is to look at existing literature on Muratova's films and to see how actually, even within that discourse, we already have references to what I would label as queerness and kind of queer approach. There is, for example, this wonderful article by Helen Ferguson on silence and shrieks in uh, Kira Muratova's films. And as we know, this is a kind of um, well-established um, approach to understanding of Muratova's movies, uh, where she writes, I'm sorry, it's a bit hard for me to kind of um, do the, the window here for the Zoom. Just bear with me a second, I'll move, I'll move it over here. So I'll read it out. Uh, there are other indications of a theatricality of the spectacle. There is a proliferation of performances in the later works. In the Ascentic Syndrome, the story of the uh, bereaved Natasha turns out to be a film performance. The stalker in the first part of three stories declaims poetry. The large gay concub concubine who lives in the Boiler House, Vinichka, sings in an operatic manner. One of the female protagonists in Enthusiasm, Fialeta, is a circus performer dressed in a ballerina's tattoo. tattoo and the protagonist in Minor People periodically breaks into song and dance, right? So this is, this is a statement which to me reads really as a reflection on the queer potential of Muratova's uh, cinema, where literally every reference is a reference to either a character who is visibly marked as uh, LGBT or queer, or whose practice in many ways belongs to this canon of queerness altogether, such as, you know, um, circus performers 
or in fact, um, you know, this sudden changes, abrupt kind of uh, shifts in uh, uh, performance per se. And of course, um, what's in the background of this discussion here is perhaps an implicit reference that Helen makes to uh, Judith Butler's works on queerness and performance, right, all together. So what if, I'm asking a bigger question here, that if we, if we are to accept that Muratova's cinema is performative, should we then also accept the idea that it is queer? Uh, my next example is of a similar type, uh, which is that we have lots and lots of publications uh, that approach Muratova's films from the point of view of embodiment, of body, and especially taking on Bakhtin's notion of the grotesque, right? Well, I don't have the time and I don't think I need to kind of unpack it. This, this is all very well known, uh, but this weird, strange, carnivalesque body that Bakhtin writes about is to me, in fact, the queer body, right? It's the body that challenges the heteronormative discourse that is always in between, that is always in the making. So to conclude this part, uh, let me just say that even if we are to revisit existing research on Kia Muratova, we can actually uh, see a lot of queer potential in the discussion that are there. And the reason why we haven't talked about this before is because of the way the field uh, has been structured, uh, because of the kind of over-focus on the politics and especially uh, the Russian government altogether. So in the very last part of my talk, what I wish to do is to talk about Muratov's queer cinema approaching it from three perspectives, what I called as queer moments, queer visualities, and queer world building. I will give some examples over here, but I'll be happy to expand on them uh, in the Q&A um, if, if, if you want me to. By queer moments, I understand um, different elements of her films, including the storyline, characters, mise-en-scene, um, objects on the screen, and the very work of the camera that becomes queer, right? That is not consistently telling the story of LGBT, but rather that allows itself to be queer in a given kind of a moment, um, uh, which is again, very particular to that approach of queer global cinema that I outlined uh, earlier today. That is not just about um, uh, the political project of emancipation, but it's rather about a, a kind of working with uh, heteronormative discourse um, as, a, as, a, as a discursive element. Just to remind you, for example, that uh, in the first story from three stories, uh, we have this uh, amazing moment when uh, the main character comes um, to this facility and as you know, uh, he brings the corpse, uh, 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 a dead body of a person with him. And as he arrives in the facility, he meets people who kind of work there. And one of them is precisely that, what Ferguson described as concubine, right? Um, a man who lives in the facility and you see him kind of coming out from an adjacent room, um, just wrapped in, in, in a blanket. Um, it's an extraordinary performance that actually follows the kind of classical canon of queerness and coming out because the character literally opens the door and comes out onto stage, right? So kind of uh, makes it, um, um, uh, comes out uh, of the closet. Also, um, well, I didn't want to kind of overload my presentation, but if you could see the door shut, you would see that there is a huge mirror that covers the door, right? So this moment of reflection of using the mirrors again is particular to uh, queer cinema. And then as you see, uh, he wears the, uh, the uh, I mean, he wraps in this blanket, but he wears as a drape, right? As a kind of a, dress or um, non-binary kind of form of clothing. Uh, of course, making a reference to the Greek canon of representation of uh, um, uh, homosexuality too. Um, and so 
this particular story is filled with a whole variety of queer moments, uh, such as this, um, you know, moment of uh, performing coming out. And then we see the performance by the act, of course, and there, they, there, there's a kind of a reference to him being gay as well that is made openly in this movie. We also see kind of other, in a way, in your face moments of queerness, such as this when two men kiss each other, right, uh, on screen. And, you know, there's always this kind of a somewhat humorous question uh, in queer studies. And where do we get to see the first male to male kiss on screen? Well, I wonder if, in fact, that was already. Uh, in the 1990s in Muratova's movie, right? Uh, that's sort of a big schmooch that we, that we see here on screen. In addition to this, as I said, very much in your face moments of queerness, we have other ones that already follow a more kind of deeper, more transgressive uh, canon of queerness, such as this scene in the second uh, story where uh, two female characters walk around the city as two flaneurs, right? And obviously there's a whole kind of reference to Virginia Woolf and a whole kind of notions of urban spaces, identity and queer subjectivity. As they walk around, um, they stop and uh, we understand that what they're observing is somebody urinating in the street. And so we actually see a puddle of kind of uh, urine on the floor, kind of, um, and somebody doing this sort of, but being invisible. And this is again, kind of the, the, the kind of queen moment when we have a references to sexual activities that remain invisible to us. What I wish to draw your attention to is not the very fact of urination, but rather the way uh, the female character looks at it, right? And this is what the other image shows over here, where it is this simultaneous queer moment of combining pleasure and disgust, right? Curiosity and feeling repelled by it, uh, kind of abhorrence of this event. Those of you who come um, uh, from the field of queer studies would kind of recognize multiple references I'm making here to, again, the essential uh, structure of uh, queerness. And later in the same story, we have um, very extended and, and very complex kind of uh, queer moments, such as when Orpha, played by Renata Litvinova, uh, murders uh, her friend, right? Um, and it is actually staged as a as a sexual act, as you can see over here, uh, with the gaze of the camera enjoying uh, the appreciation of this Eris and Tanatas moment in the film. And this scene in particular is concluded with the view uh, that is carried out through a reverse shot where we see the kind of the interior of uh, the building in which uh, the murder takes place. And if you pay attention, there is this uh, wonderful door uh, in, the, in the background, right? Uh, with um, the visual kind of decor, which is a reference to female sexual organs. And so like the door in my previous example, there is a sense of transgressions of transfer from one environment to another. Uh, and so queerness here is not only about sexual acts, it's not only about uh, erotics, it's not about only transgression, but it's also kind of transfer of spaces and subjectivities. Another element of um, queer cinema uh, uh, that I would like to talk about is the queer visualities, or rather a kind of a vocabulary of queerness that uh, we see in global queer cinema, but also in her work. I'll speak about just two, because again, these are the ones that are most familiar to us uh, in general discussion of Muratova's films. And this is the use of doubles and the use of repetition or echoing, which is so, so specific to Muratova films generally. We hear characters repeating the same phrase multiple times. Uh, we, we see kind of um, 
the same situation being played out uh, several times or certain gesture, like the famous gesture of a woman following the kind of um, line of a Greek column and uh, in the shape again of ovaries as well. Uh, so we see that all over uh, Murata's work, like in the second story in this film, we see Orpha killing another woman that we understand could be her mother. Uh, and they're dressed in uh, the same style. Uh, they have similar kind of, you know, uh, makeup uh, and so on. And so they're really framed as doubles, as a kind of a doppelgangers over here. And whether Orpha kills someone else or herself is something that we can actually interpret again as a kind of queer potential over here. Uh, you can see that it's about intimacy too. It's, it's very sexual. Um, you, if, if you've seen this film recently, you will remember that in this moment, um, the actor, Renata Litvinova, actually adjusts her breasts. She literally kind of puts them back, drawing attention to the sexual organs and um, drawing them um, uh, closer to um, kind of our thinking about uh, queerness. And doubling doesn't have to be articulated in, in, in such a precise sexual moment. It can be carried out in a more abstract way too, as we see in the third story when the child kills uh, an old man and then she plays um, with the toys. And you can see this doubling that, that kind of takes place in across different vectors of, sorry, different kind of dimensions of the shot. Uh, in the foreground, we have two identical toys, but also in the background, you have uh, dolls that are kind of given to us as the non-human embodiment uh, of queerness, okay? And the very last bit uh, for today's discussion is going to be the concept of queer world building, meaning that it's a practice where queerness is carried out across different platforms and beyond the actual films. In other words, uh, it exists in various extensions, other films, and generally popular culture and, and culture altogether. Here, I would say that queer world building with Muratova, of course, is centered around uh, two principal characters and two prin sorry, two principal actors that Muratova has worked with, and that is Renat Litvinova, uh, and also oh, his name just escaped me. Pardon me. It's here on the slide. Uh, uh, Jan Daniel. Um, both of uh, these characters are known um, uh, are known as um, people who have been involved in uh, queer practices. So whether, for example, it's Renata's uh, relationship with the Russian singer uh, Zinfira or Jan's um, uh, kind of work with uh, queer communities um, in various countries. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that Muratova, in a way, foregrounds the construction of bigger queer worlds that we associate uh, with Litvinova or Jan Daniel, for that matter. Just to give you a sense of how this works, I thought I would focus on Jan Daniel because um, Murat, uh, Litvinova is so well known and it's a kind of a self-evident case. Um, he's, um, he's appeared in virtually all films by Muratov, especially um, those that made in the 1990s and noughties, but he's also worked in other films appearing in very similar roles and kind of ad adopting this kind of a queer lens and queer optic uh, in other films as well. So it's not something that is particular just to Muratova's films, but also something that is perceptible in other films too. He's appeared in uh, Russian language, uh, popular media, television shows, and this is going to be like actually my final um, um, visual over here, right? Uh, him uh, performing at one of the kind of uh, popular programs, talk shows on Russian television uh, that are screened uh, in prime time. This is all to say that the outreach of queer world building is actually uh, very extensive, uh, and and therefore the kind of the the impact of Muratova's queer cinema 
can be felt uh, in other kind of uh, parts of uh, audiovisual culture too. So this is where I wish to finish today. Thank you ever so much for your attention. And I've put this two wonderful people here on the final slide um, so that um, we all feel happy. <laughs> Thank you.